Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Tyler Reed, and I'm a co-founder and CTO of Zona Space Systems. I want to start with a big thanks to MGA for the kind invitation and for organizing. We're grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this series and just to be connecting with the greater navigation and GNSS community. Today, we'll be talking about our vision at Zona for commercial satellite navigation to support autonomy. We're going to break this talk roughly into four pieces. The first will set the stage. We'll begin with some recent trends in aerospace as well as trends in navigation to give a sense of where we are and where we're going. We'll discuss some new drivers pushing navigation requirements to new levels, particularly from the autonomous vehicle sector. This forms our motivation for commercial satellite navigation layer from LEO, which is fast to evolve and which can meet the demands of these coming intelligent transportation systems. And I will conclude with an introduction to Zona Space Systems and our approach and plans for commercial LEO PNT. Let's start with a look on what's in orbit. This is actually a view from 2016 in November. And at that time, there was just over 1,400 operational satellites. And you can see some distinct groups here. You have about half of them in geosynchronous orbit, and that's in the outer belt there. Uh, but the other half is in a low Earth orbit, and about 100 or so, which is in medium Earth orbit, which represents the navigation satellites. Fast forward to today, and a lot has changed, particularly in LEO. There are now twice as many operational satellites as there was, and nearly three times as many as there was in LEO just a short time ago. The movement towards more satellites in LEO was really started with an increased demand for connectivity. We see SpaceX, OneWeb, and others that are all building constellations of thousands or tens of thousands of satellites to provide global broadband. These are the so-called mega constellations, and they represent the new space economy enabled by lower launch costs and new satellite production techniques. To give some numbers, SpaceX already has more than 1,000 of, uh, of its satellites on orbit, uh, and it has aspirations for up to 40,000 of these satellites ultimately. But what does this mean for navigation? To understand the potential here, I'd like to look to the past to see where we might be going. Historically, new technologies and modes of transportation brought new navigation challenges, resulting in many technologies to support them. Just over 100 years ago, maritime systems made use of celestial navigation, uh, giving kilometers of position accuracy. 30 years after that, in World War II, we see the advent of radio and navigation to support uh, primarily aviation. And this was giving us hundreds of years of accuracy. 30 years after that, in the Cold War, we see the first satellite navigation system transit, giving us tens of meters of accuracy. And now we all enjoy meter level accuracy thanks to GPS and the smartphones in our pockets. But the question is, what's next? And the reason for choosing this 30 centimeter point is it's, uh, it's very specifically chosen. And interestingly, if you look at this, uh, you know, this overall trend here, there's a clear uh, direction we're going in, in terms of navigation. And there's really sort of a Moore's law of, of navigation. And that is every 30 years, we see approximately a 10 times improvement in largely available location accuracy. And we also see that along with that, we see investment in new infrastructure that was driven by a new need. Often that need was in some kind of transportation sector. And what is that need today? Well, this is where I'd like to make the shift into autonomous systems. Intelligent or autonomous systems or transportation systems are pushing these needs. Uh, these autonomous systems come in many forms, aerial, ground, maritime systems. And satellite navigation holds a lot of potential as a ubiquitous solution to support all of these systems. And an important aspect here is a common reference frame. These systems ultimately have to work together, and they must share a common reference to interoperate. I would like to focus on autonomous driving, uh, partly because this is my background, where I worked at Ford Motor Company for a few years. Uh, work from Ford that I was a part of indicates that 10 centimeters, 95% accuracy is what's needed uh, for autonomous driving. This is the width of the paint on the road. That's how, sort of how wide 10 centimeters is. That's the width of the paint on the road. And as hard of a requirement as that is, the hard part really is the requirement for safety. Now, this is still developing, but the thinking seems to be that location needs to be known to the 30 centimeter level at the strictest standard in automotive, which is automotive safety integrity level D. And to dive a little bit deeper into that, first we need to understand uh, you know, how location is used in autonomous vehicles. There are essentially five steps to self-driving. There's the first one, which is where am I? So this is localization. This gives you the first order context. You know, where are the roads? Where are the other static objects in my map? Next is what's around me, often called perception. 
This is, you know, relative to me, where are the pedestrians, cyclists, other vehicles, things that I need to be aware of to make decisions. After that is where are those objects going? So this is prediction. This is especially a hard problem today because humans are just very difficult to predict. And then after that is where should I go? Planning. Plan my path around those other actors in the scene and around the infrastructure, you know, using the rules of the road, et cetera. And then how do I get there? This is control. So this is throttle, braking, and steering that's needed to achieve that path. Now in this process, localization forms the foundation. And because this forms the foundation, it has the strictest requirements uh, because failures at this stage cascade through the rest of the system. But what is the actual target level of safety in autonomy to try to derive requirements uh, for these systems? Well, being a form of transportation, it has been suggested that the long-term goal uh, be set to the gold, the gold standard in transit today, which is civil aviation. And when you work out the equivalencies, this target is about one fatality per 10 billion miles driven. That's you know, about the equivalent uh, safety record that civil aviation has, which, by the way, is about 100 times better uh, than automotive is today. To translate this into requirements on the localization subsystem, that means you're only allowed one failure for every 10 billion, for every billion miles. Now, what is a failure here? Well, for, for localization, the bounds of operation are defined by the geometry of, of the problem, which that is, you know, how big are vehicles? What is the size and shape of the road? And it turns out that the protection levels you need for city driving to make all that work is about 30 centimeters. And so putting all this together, it means that for safe operation, the vehicle must be within 30 centimeters of the true position and that that must fail, one, that must fail less than once in a billion miles of driving. You know, to put a billion miles in context, that's about 250 times the entire U.S. road network. And so that's every highway, every neighborhood, every rural road, uh, but also every condition like snowstorms and construction zones. And so this is really a tough challenge. The reason this is so challenging is that the position protection levels are just unprecedented. The level of safety is the standard in other modes of transportation, so aviation, maritime rail. This level of safety is, is exactly the same level. Uh, but the degree of certainty you require in your position is at least an order of magnitude, if not two, uh, more than what these others achieve today. So, for example, in aviation, you know, that position bound of 35 meters comes from needing to know your position to find the runway. Uh, in rail, 2.5 meters is about what you need to know what track you're on. And so getting to automotive, you know, requiring 30 centimeters, uh, that's, a, that's just a huge challenge for the, the whole navigation community. How do self-driving cars actually localize? How do they use GPS today? Well, they use a lot of sensors to, do, to solve that problem, uh, but primarily level four self-driving cars usually rely on LiDAR and 3D map matching for localization. Other sensors are used as well, so inertial measurement units, cameras, radar, uh, ultrasonics. Uh, these are often used for object recognition. And of course, GNSS is often used for high-level routing. So, you know, what roads do I need to turn on to get to my destination? However, often LiDAR is still king, and a lot of this choice has to do with the history of self-driving going back to the days of the DARPA challenges. But it also now has to do with where these vehicles are operating, which is in cities and typically in good weather. And so cities have sufficient 3D information for getting a position fix from a map. Uh, open flat areas, uh, which is where GNSS works well, is often where LiDAR tends to struggle. And so you can see uh, these two things working together uh, well to solve the problem uh, completely. In terms of weather, you know, this is often why we see, you know, pilot programs in places like California, Arizona, uh, and Florida, uh, because, you know, these adverse weather conditions, it just helps to bound the problem. Uh, but as soon as you start to get into, you know, places with more adverse weather conditions, um, you know, and larger seasonal changes, uh, there are many challenges that still remain with, with using these sensors uh, to actually solve the safety case. Uh, but it's even more difficult in, in bad weather. And, you know, LiDAR and these other uh, sensing modalities are just subject to more things like absorption and scattering. And so how do we, you know, solve this problem more completely? Well, one approach that's been taken by the automotive industry is redundancy. And to get to the ASIL D rated complete localization system, you really need two or more independent ASIL B systems. And this means that localization systems running in parallel, you know, with different uh, failure modes uh, must be implemented. And there are largely two methods employed today. There's the relative approach, which localizes to a high resolution map, so based on LiDAR, based on cameras. And then there's the 
absolute localization approach, uh, which works more on the premises of GNSS. And so certainly a lot of work has gone into the relative localization branch, uh, but how do we get there with GNSS? Well, let's begin with the challenges. You have atmospheric effects on the signal, you have satellite faults, uh, you have challenges with availability from obstructions or interference, uh, multipath with signal reflections, and potentially bad actors uh, with spoofing. And the state of the art today really is focused on the first two, so that is building better receivers uh, and services to overlay information to supplement the GNSS signal. So these are things like anti-jam technologies, uh, correction services that are deployed on continent scales, and these are all great things towards solving this problem. But how do we further address the last three? And this is where I'd like to talk more about the benefits of a low Earth orbiting system to complement existing GNSS. One way to pose this is asking, you know, what might the autonomous you know, group ask for? And in my experience, there are three major asks in terms of enhancements uh, that folks would like to see. One is improved precision. So, of course, there's lots of folks already doing that with these wide-scale correction services. Another is, you know, better availability and resilience. So this is stronger signals and more of them. And a big one really is security, and this is encryption and data authentication. And so one approach to bringing all of these features, you know, you know, of course, with a MEO constellation backbone like, uh, like GNSS, uh, with an additional commercial LEO layer that can adapt uh, and add capability and evolve quickly, uh, perhaps on a five-year time scale to keep pace with demand, you know, a lot can be done with that kind of technology. You know, new LEO signals aren't bound by legacy, so there can be inclusion of new things such as encryption and data authentication. And being closer to Earth, they have the potential to deliver much stronger signals strengthening us to interference. And of course, the last one is the fast motion across the sky, the rapid geometry change gets a lot in the way of rapid convergence for precise point positioning, as well as favorable characteristics for multipath. Well, and how do you do this? Well, it's enabled by recent changes in aerospace, you know, the conditions that have given us these mega constellations. One enabler is launch cost, you know, reduced by more than a factor of 10 compared to 20 years ago, and it's continued to is expected to continue to decrease. Another, another enabler is mass production techniques for satellites and components. To give some numbers, OneWeb makes more than two satellites per day, and SpaceX launches 60 satellites per launch to LEO. And the result is highly available satellite platforms and components uh, that are half a million dollars to orbit. Now, of course, you do need more satellites in LEO compared to MEO uh, to get the same satellite visibility. Uh, but with the economics represented on this slide, it's an interesting opportunity when you consider that one GPS-3 satellite is closer to $500 million. And so this is where Zona Space Systems comes. Zona was founded in 2019, and our mission is to enable intelligent transportation systems to operate safely in any environment to benefit everyone. Our founders are coming from a combination of aerospace industry as well as GNSS research. And our team today consists of around 17 people. And we are working towards putting our first two demonstra demonstration satellites on orbit to demonstrate some of these very concepts. Building such a system doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we have a stage rollout plan uh, with different levels of service along the way. Phase zero is happening this year, uh, where we are working uh, with the navigation payload for ground demonstration of the technology. So you could think of this as a satellite uh, on top of a building and doing some demonstrations in that regard. Phase one is approximately 40 satellites, which offers a one in view GNSS augmentation service over population centers. Phase two is about 70 satellites, which offers a one in view global service. And phase three is about 300 satellites, and this gives a GPS level satellite visibility uh, and full positioning services uh, that are precise and secure. So that's all I had for today. Uh, I want to Give a big thanks again to the organizers and to all of you for your attention today. We're very much grateful for the opportunity. And if you'd like to learn more, please uh, see our work in SAE, IEEE, and the ION. And uh, we are very happy to chat more offline. And so please feel free to reach out. Uh, my email is at the bottom of the slide here. And so thank you again for your attention. Have a good day.